everybody. We got a great one today, you know, for a change. Nobel Prize winning climatologist Michael Mann joins us for the third time. He's that good. And this is one you'll want to listen to, especially if you have a friend or relative who says, hey, the climate always changes. We've had ice ages, a meteor wiped out the dinosaurs. There were palm trees at the South Pole. So these record hot summers we've been having, that's not a big deal. Well, this episode is for you and for them. Because Michael has a new book, Our Fragile Moment, which explains why this is a unique moment in the history of the planet, at least in terms of the human being period. And we've got some important decisions to make. And the good news is we know what to do. Well, we've had an eventful week. The shutdown we discussed last week with Norm Ornstein was averted. Uh, for a while anyway, in a uh, pretty chaotic and ugly way. But uh, what's new? Oh, uh, Kevin McCarthy uh, isn't the Speaker of the House anymore. I kind of hoped that Democrats would make a secret deal with him and give him enough votes to keep him in there under the condition that he would just do whatever they told him to do. I I bet he would have gone for that. I'm not sure how long it would have remained a secret, but it seems like the House is in in chaos anyway. Well, I hope this gives voters some idea of just how fucked up the House Republicans are and vote them out next fall. But, you know, a lot of stuff's going to happen between now and then. Uh, Jim Jordan as a speaker? <sighs> oh, I God, hope not. Please. In the meantime, uh, there's Trump. A judge decided he's kind of a crook. Uh, That may cost Trump $250 million. Ouch. That's got to hurt if you're worth only a couple billion or maybe uh, no billion. It'd be funny if after being such a crook for so many years, if he really isn't that rich. Wouldn't it be great if after paying his legal fees and fines and settlements, if At the end of all this, if he was worth like $25,000, ah, he'll figure a way to live large. In prison, he's got the four indictments, after all, with the 91 felony charges. Of course, ex-presidents are all afforded the courtesy of 24-hour Secret Service protection. And if he ends up in the big house, that could come in handy. If, say, Trump was in a cell that... Other inmates could look into the Secret Service, could form a screen when Trump has to, you know, take a dump, you know, to preserve his dignity and the dignity of the office that he once held. Also in Trump world, Trump has made it clear that he thinks that Mark Milley, the outgoing chairman of the Joint Chiefs, should be executed for treason. You see, after the 2020 election, remember that that election? Right after it was determined that Joe Biden had won that election and that then-President Donald Trump had lost, there was some worry that Trump, who was still the president, might start a war. So Milley called his counterpart in China and assured him, don't worry, I'm on top of it, I'll let you know if the president is thinking of starting a war with you. And Trump said this past week that that was treason and that Milley should be executed. Now, I don't know if you remember this, but I've mentioned it on the podcast right after the election was called for Biden. I tweeted that they shouldn't take the nuclear codes away from Trump, that they should just give him the wrong codes. Anyway, Trump wants Milley executed, and we will follow that story if, in fact, Milley is tried for treason and, of course, cover the execution uh, if it comes to pass. More on the subject of this Al Franken podcast episode. Uh, Trump also weighed in this past week on forest fires. He said we should just wet down the forest floors like they do evidently in Austria. That's why we have so many forest fires. We're not hosing down 
the forest floors. Which brings me back to Michael Mann in his new book, Our Fragile Moment. Michael explains that for the first time, mankind has a choice to make to either keep us in range for our children and our grandchildren and posterity, or we can blow it. We have a clear choice. Climate change is not a hoax, and the good news is we can do something about it, and we know what that is. Michael Mann is with us again because he's fabulous. We've got a great one today. You know, for a change. Today we're going to discuss uh, kind of the history of the universe. Right. Right. And where we are right now in the history of the Earth, which you discuss in our Fragile Moment, which is your new book. And I got an advanced copy a little while ago, and I haven't finished it yet, but my God, I wanted you on because uh, this is going to uh, explain so much to my listeners, especially when they have a friend like I have. Bob Danielson, who I went to high school with, still my friend, very good friend. He was a lefty in high school. Uh, then something happened <laughs> and, and uh, not quite sure. Um, he became a tax lawyer. I think that's what happened. Mm. But Bob's a great guy, uh, but he's he, he believes there's climate change. But this is what he believes. The climate's always changed. <laughs> OK, have you ever heard that before? No, never. It, I, I've never. Nobody's ever said that to me uh, until now. Until yeah, you. he said there used to be like uh, palm trees uh, uh, in Antarctica. Right. right. And so, okay. And so, when I started reading this, what this explains so well is that yeah, over millions, hundreds of millions of years, it changes. Yep. But now we have a change that's taken place in 200 years that yep. is uh, threatening us. So I want to start at the very beginning. I want to start. When was the Big Bang? When was that? Oh, what is it? The 13 uh, million. Uh, we've been extending it back in, in time. Uh, thir- 13 billion years, I believe. But, but it's gone farther and farther back uh, as we've looked farther and farther out. Um, into the horizons of space. But yeah, billions and billions of years, as the great Carl Sagan would have said. Well, also, every hour gets an hour older. Uh, That's true. That's true. It's aging. You can sort of tell. But you're discovering, but they're discovering that it, it happened longer ago. And I never understood the Big Bang, but that was all the mass in the universe. This is the theory anyway was in one place and it just blew up right that's it that's that's exactly what happened there was nothing and then there was a huge explosion and that produced everything that we see um in this universe oh wait a minute okay that's a little different than i conceive it see i have really hard problems conceiving these things you said there was nothing and then yes. it blew up. so nothing blew up or there was a thing that blew up it came out of nothing. <laughs> it, it was, uh, I'm going to blow your mind, Al. I'm not okay. sure you want to. Uh, oh, man. You know, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, you know what? I should have taken some acid for this one. Well, I was sort of thinking, like, uh, I was recently watching Trading Places and your your character in, in Trading Places. That was Places. pot. That was just pot. Yeah, well, yes, but that, that, that might still help here. Um, that was my character had smoked pot. And <laughs> uh, and you uh, in, in Trading Places, I was baggage handler number one and Tom Davis baggage handler number two. And we had a yes. scene where we smoked a joint. And therefore, yeah. everything we did subsequent to that in the movie, we acted stoned. But... Uh, Eddie Murphy, his character smokes a joint in a toilet. Remember, and he's in, that's right. And, and Listen, uh, so here's the Duke brothers talking about him. Yes. Right, right. And he, yes. so he's standing up on the toilet seat while smoking a joint. Therefore, he, John Landis, the director, didn't want to have two joints being smoked. So we were <laughs> just idiot baggage handler number one and idiot baggage handler number two. But they, having smoked pot would not have understood the big bang, but the big bang, we're talking <laughs> billions and billions of years. That's right. Yes. Uh, and, and how big is the universe? Just, you know, how big the universe is? Uh, it's, uh, in, in light years, uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's basically 14 billion light years. 
um, (laughs) 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 wow that's its dimension yes so that it would take light uh, at the speed of light you travel for 14 billion years to get from one end to the other. That's my understanding. Now, some of my physics colleagues may uh, correct me. It's a simple-minded calculation that I just did there, but I think it's at least the right order of magnitude, uh, which is what we usually look for. So it's big. <laughs> yes. It's big. And where are we in the universe? Where where would Earth be in the universe? Do we know exactly? Well, we're not in the center you know we'd like to think of ourselves as the center of uh, everything but no we're in the spiral bands of uh, a galaxy in the milky way you know everything that we know everything that we see around us is you know we see from the vantage point of a tiny little dot a pale blue dot as carl sagan called it that is located in the spiral arm of a galaxy okay and how old is the earth the Earth, on the other hand, because we just said the universe is about 14 billion years, um, the Earth about 4.5 billion years. So we've been around for, you know, about a third of the lifetime of the universe. Okay. And how do we know that? How do we know this 4.5 billion uh, there, there are various ways to, to estimate that radiometric dating um, using, uh, I believe, lead, for example, isotopes. But uh, there, there are ways to do that. Yep. That's what I would have said. <laughs> uh, okay, so 4.5 billion years old. And at first it was very hot, the Earth. Well, you know, it was. Uh, Early on, it was still being bombarded by very large bodies, uh, planetesimals, like uh, moon-sized objects. So we call that the heavy bombardment uh, period. And uh, (laughs) (laughs) for all lack of a better... So there was no life, obviously, so no no one was going on. We call it the Hadean because it would have been like Hades, the underworld. It, uh. it was inhospitable to life. One of these huge asteroids or bodies would hit the planet and vaporize the oceans. And so if you're doing your best to form life and then all of a sudden you get hit by one of those things, there goes life. It's gone and you have to start over. And we think maybe life did form and start over several times. We might have been, who knows, you know, the umpteenth experiment that finally took as we left that period of bombardment and and into a more sort of hospitable period where well, that's uh, my, that's bob danielson's point is that the weather always changes <laughs> you are so i guess he's right this, this whole climate thing must be wrong we, we could talk about we could just continue to talk about movies uh <laughs> no, this whole climate no no i see the value of this book to me is that the periods of time that we're talking about uh, in which uh, climate changes are very often millions and millions and millions of years. That's right. You yourself have won a Nobel Prize. I contributed to the award uh, of a Nobel Prize, but it's kind of you to mention that. Yep. Okay. I say you won a Nobel Prize because <laughs> you're on my show and I can say that. But you were part of the uh, IP. What, what was that? Uh, IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Okay, that's the International Panel on Climate Change that won the Nobel. Now, uh, the IPCC, uh, the hockey stick, tell us about the hockey stick. Uh, It's a graph my co-authors and I published more than 25 years ago now that uh, attempted to reconstruct how temperatures had varied in the distant past beyond the roughly century and a half period where we have thermometer measurements, we turn to other natural recorders like tree rings and corals and ice cores, that sort of stuff to to sort of piece together that puzzle of how it changed over the more distant past. And what we found was that the warming spike of the past century um, is unprecedented as far back as we could go, a thousand years. It looks like an upturned hockey stick and the blade is the, the warming that we've caused through fossil fuel burning. That's a short period of time compared to the 4.5 that's right. Billion years. One of the things that kind of excited me in the book was I'm reading about uh, some of our earlier civilizations, right. uh, like in the Tigris and Euphrates. Yep. And that became drier, right? Yes. And so that civilization actually moved south. 
we, or lost their the their standing yeah. as this primary, you know, leading civilization and went south because of climate change. But ha- and how long did that take? Yeah, no, in fact, it, both directions. So it arose because of climate change in the first place. Mesopotamia, the first uh, city state 6,000 years ago, because they developed irrigation and they needed irrigation because it was getting drier. So you needed to be able to engage in engineering projects like irrigation that could draw upon the fact that there was water in the Tigers and Euphrates rivers. And Mesopotamia literally means the, the plain uh, between the rivers, uh, the land between the rivers. And what they were able to do, even though things were drying off, they could tap into the water supply from those rivers by using ancient irrigation techniques. And that afforded them the stability of civilization. But you needed specialized workforces who could do things like that, that helped lead to the specialization of roles um, in you know society uh, and gave us our first civilization. And it was a sprawling civilization, as you allude to, that spread well to the south. This is in the area, you know, today, Syria, Iran, Iraq, the Fertile Crescent, we sometimes call it. Uh, That's where Mesopotamia originated. And it was a sprawling empire. And what happened was it became so sprawling that it was sort of thinly spread. And then it was hit by a huge, we think, a big volcanic eruption that, for reasons I won't go into, caused a very dramatic sudden drying of that region. And because they were already stressed for water resources, and here it got even drier, and the the regions to the south where it was even drier had no water and couldn't engage in agriculture, and that created sort of different interests in the north and the south. It created conflict. And if this sounds eerily familiar, it's because it's eerily familiar Um, That conflict even involved the construction of a wall to keep the folks from the south from coming into this region, which had more resources, Um, sort of a, uh, a tale for our times. And so civilization arose to provide stability, and it did provide stability to a point, but hit by a hard enough shock in the form of that extreme rapid drying from that volcanic eruption uh, it, it collapsed. I sort of liken it to uh, you know civilization in this regard to a catamaran, where it gives you stability for sort of small motions, but it also becomes completely unstable if you're hit by a big enough wave. And that's what happened. Now, the significance of this when I read this in your book was, okay, but that wasn't a global. <laughs> right. That wasn't global. Right. That affected them. Okay. And what we're looking at now is global. So the difference between, well, we've always had climate change. We do have climate change and different regions, their climate changes a little bit, but we're talking about the globe here. So I want to talk about that's right. That, that, you know, obviously they're different. We've had ice ages. We've had uh, the dinosaurs wiped out by a meteor. We had a, a huge meteor change everything. Yep. But I want you to speak to how this is different from the different kinds of when everyone says, well, the climate's always changed, how this is completely different from what they're talking about. Yeah. And, you know, and I do get into the lessons, for example, the extinction of the dinosaurs, the asteroid collision, what, you know, what lessons that has for us today. There's some interesting parallels. And, and, and uh, as the, um, the great sting of the police, uh, and I recount this in the book, uh, you know, once said the, 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 um, the song, uh, Walking in Your Footsteps, Hey Mighty Brontosaurus, don't you have a lesson for us? Well, don't get hit by a meteor. But this isn't what we're talking about. No. A glo- a climate change now, a global climate change now, is about burning CO2 and, right. and other exactly. greenhouse and, gases. And we have agency, right? The dinosaurs couldn't do anything about their plight. There's nothing they could, they didn't know what it was happening. They couldn't have seen it coming. And there's nothing they could have done about it. But we, this is a problem of our own making. And I think the, the point that you're also making here is that, It's, first of all, the scale. We're talking about global 
climate changes, not just regional climate changes. So there's no place to go. There's no place to go to escape the detrimental impacts of climate change. And we see that every summer. Speaking of summer, yeah. this summer. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Yep. It, it's getting warmer. It's just getting hotter. And we've had, I mean, what what's the data on the last, the hottest years and record in the last several years? What, yeah, I mean, the last decade is the hottest decade on record. This year will be the new record temperature. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. When you say that, my friend Bob Danielson would say, it wasn't it hotter when it was molten? Right. So when I say on record, obviously, <laughs> the historical records, as far back as our records go, and they do go now thousands of years in the form of... Uh, I'm these, just uh, trying to give you yeah. some idea of how obnoxious yeah. Bob is. Yeah. No, <laughs> I, we all have a friend like Bob. I think, in fact, I think I have I love a friend Bob. Bob who's, you know, who's, yeah, just but, like you know. Uncle... Uncle Joe, who we see at, you know, Thanksgiving and regales us with the latest episodes of uh, Fox News. What I want is my audience to be able to talk to their Bob Danielson after this. Yes, exactly. And very clearly explain the difference of this and the difference between how we went from a period of an ice age to not an ice age. Yeah. And how long a period that was and why that happened and how what's happening now is due to burning fuel, burning hydrocarbons and uh, greenhouse gases and yeah. and what that means. Because I in, in the last chapter, you talk about what we're uh, looking at, different scenarios, right? Representative concentration pathways. Is that <laughs> right. what you call it? Yeah, very uh yes, it just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Yeah, that's what that's what we use to basically describe different possible futures, uh, choices that we could make about how serious we get. And that scared the the crap out of me because some of these representative concentration pathways, I mean, sometimes they just represent, you know what? Uh right-wing people just say, well, we're taking over the government and we're just Forget it. Right. We're just going to burn a thing because that's uh, good for our economy. And then you see unbelievable warming. I mean, not that unbelievable, but eight degrees Celsius or something, which means massive death. And we have people die from heat every year. How many people died uh, from heat this past year? You have some kind of number? Well, thousands and thousands of people. And one of the problems here, uh, Al, is that um, a lot of the official estimates are not reliable. They undercount because, you know, say most of the impacts of heat stress aren't that you literally, your body got too hot and you died. It's the stress from heat causes those with preconditions, diabetic, uh, heart problems are, are more likely uh, to sort of perish with uh, the, the, the stress provided by extreme heat. And so, you, you know, you see heart attacks reported. Um, there's an increase in heart attacks. There's an increase in other ailments. And there are ways of trying to uh, look at it, for example, in terms of excess deaths the, and, and excess deaths that, you know, we can attribute then to, you know, there was something in the environment. Um, uh, for example, it, it was extremely hot and we see uh, on those very hot days that there was an unusually large number of deaths relative to what you would normally be seeing uh, that time of year, then, you know, we can attribute that. And you also have to add in the health effects of fossil fuel extraction, um, refineries, uh, pollution, air pollution, water pollution, toxic chemicals. Um, and so if you look at the full footprint of fossil fuel burning, which is the warming, the heat, the climate change it's causing, and the air and water quality issues from extracting and refining and burning fossil fuels, it is uh, responsible for something like 25% of all deaths now. Okay, so what are these representative concentration pathways, right? Yeah. What are the range here? I mean, let's say uh, we do what we should be doing. Yep. Okay, so let's start with that, and then and then go uh, tick it up to what uh, the next level of, well, we should be doing it, but we're not quite doing it, which is probably what sure. close to what 
is happening now. Then to the uh, what we're doing now, we we just get, we start lack getting lax on that, right? And then the ball game where we go like, oh fuck it, you know, let's, uh, you know, this isn't real. The climate always changes. Yeah, the Republican Party platform is what you mean. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Oh, okay, yes. Okay, go through those. Is four about right or? Yeah, sure. I mean, okay. you know, the scenario, the first scenario is that we get off fossil fuels as soon as possible. And, and you know, we could ramp carbon emissions down 50% over the next decade. It's doable. The obstacles aren't technology. They're political at this point. Um, and if we did that, we could prevent warming of more than three degrees Fahrenheit. That's something that, you know, we believe we can adapt to. There's still going to be impacts because we're already seeing impacts, right? We're not going to avoid, right. uh, but but we can prevent. Um, You're saying impacts. three degree increase from when? Uh, relative to pre-industrial. So that's one and a half Celsius. And right now we're at about 1.2 Celsius. So there's a small margin there. We're getting close to that three Fahrenheit, 1.5 Celsius, three Fahrenheit. Um, if we continue business as usual for another decade, there's no way we get there. There's no way we can avoid crossing that crossing. threshold. Let's say that we sort of continue with business as usual. And what I mean business as usual would be current policies. Like we don't do anything more to deal with the climate crisis, but we do take advantage of the gains we've already made. For example, you know, there is some movement already uh, towards renewable energy. Carbon emissions have flattened out. So there, there's some progress. So let's say we, we take that but we don't do anything more. Uh, we'll call that current policies. Then you're looking at sort of more like uh, three degrees uh, warming of the planet, three degrees Celsius. Celsius, which, yeah. Which isn't great. There you're going to see, you know, you know, so that's five, more than five degree Fahrenheit warming of the planet relative to the pre-industrial. At that point, you're talking about, you know, the sorts of extreme damaging weather events that we've seen so far, you know, double that or triple that. I mean, that's what we're dealing with in that scenario. So 120 in Phoenix. Right. Yes. That kind um, of thing. Or 110 in Seattle and Portland a couple of years they, ago. Well, they've been, they, they've gotten that hot and uh, you know, yeah, two summers a, ago. Two yeah. summers ago. Yeah. I mean, so yeah. So something like that, which we call it a black swan. It's a, a, a very rare event that we don't expect to see, you know, more than once in thousands of years, Th those quote unquote black swans become, you know, pigeons, <laughs> they become ubiquitous. And, you know, we see those become regular events. Uh, those extreme events that are devastating today uh, become that much more common. And then if you talk about worse than business as usual, uh, I call it sort of reverting to past practices where, you know, Republicans <laughs> take uh, full control of our government and set the policy or, you know, communicates to the rest of the world. Well, the Supreme Court has already been trying to do that. Well, right. They've blocked, uh, you know, the administration's, uh, some of their executive actions. So let's say that the United States decides that we're just going to double down. We're going to extract every bit of fossil fuels uh, around. And we send that message to the rest of the world. Because after all, we're the biggest legacy carbon polluter. We've put more carbon pollution into the atmosphere than any other country. And so if if we go back on our word and refuse to do anything, you know, there's reason to believe it, it, it gives all the other countries an excuse to do the same. So that's sort of a, a worst case scenario where we just sort of revert. We throw away the progress we've already made. We We extract every fossil fuel we can get our hands on. Then you're talking, as you alluded to, and you're talking, you know, eight, nine degrees uh, Fahrenheit warming of the planet where it starts to resemble the sort of dystopian futures that Hollywood has given us um, of what, you know, what that sort of almost post-apocalyptic world could look like. Um, so we can create a disaster film if that's what we want to do by just continuing, not only continuing with business as usual, but again, sort of getting rid of the policies that we've already passed to deal with climate. And so the choice is ours. Um, uh, we can maintain a livable planet um, if we act quickly and dramatically, and we can create a largely unlivable planet if we go down that, that path of, uh, of uh, wanton carbon burning. Okay, let, let's go back to my friend again and the, the climate has always changed. Can you go through? Oh, I thought we had convinced him now. No, he's still. He's not even listening. 
<laughs> Darn, you're right. <laughs> right. I'll call him. I I'll okay. call him, and he'll listen to this. Okay, he good. Will. I he want will. to hear back. You know how. Okay, how I, I, I will. Yeah. Okay, so tell Bob now when he says there used to be there there were palm trees in Antarctica. There's always been climate change, so why should we worry? Yeah. Can you just give us some history of the planet? in terms of how these changes took place and how many years yeah. and why that is a, a fallacious argument that Bob yeah. is No, making. actually, he's, he's right. Um, so I guess the jig is up. Uh, no, uh, he's not right. And, and here's why. These changes, you're absolutely right. Over 100 million years, the time that you know, dinosaurs were roaming the polar regions, CO2 levels, carbon dioxide levels were much higher than they are today, probably more than three times or four times today. Uh, the planet was much warmer. That is all true. And nature buried that carbon under the surface of the planet uh, through you know, dead vegetation, dead creatures that get buried. Um, their carbon, their organic carbon is eventually turned into coal and natural gas and oil, those fossil fuels. So we're taking all those dead things that accumulated over 100 million years, and we're putting their carbon back into the atmosphere a million times faster. We're putting it into the atmosphere over 100 years, a million times faster than it took to bury that carbon. And, and that's the real problem, the rate of change, the rate at which we are increasing carbon in the atmosphere, and the rate of the warming that that's causing has no precedent as far back uh, as we can go. You talked about the last ice age and there's the meltdown when we came out of that uh, last ice age between 18 and 12,000 years ago. Well, that might seem rapid and it certainly is on a geological scale, but it was a hundred times slower. The warming coming out of the ice age was a hundred times slower than the warming we're causing today. The warming from an event we call the PETM, it's the Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum. And that just rolls off the tongue too, doesn't it? Well, the PETM, it happened about 10 million years after the dinosaurs were uh, extinguished by that asteroid. It happened about 56 million years ago, where there was a relatively sudden spike in carbon dioxide due to a very intense period of volcanic activity that put a whole lot of carbon, took it out of the solid earth and put it into the atmosphere in the form of CO2. Um, and that was a rapid warming event and it led to extinctions of various animal species. But that, what we point to that event and we say, well, that's our best analog for a rapid warming event in the past, a geological rapid warming event caused by the release of CO2 naturally. We call that a rapid climate change event, but that was a hundred times slower than the warming we're causing today. And so that's the problem, right? We've got 8 billion people living courtesy of a societal infrastructure that we've built that relies upon the stability of our climate over the thousands of years that that infrastructure was created. That's our fragile moment. Now, how long, how long have human beings been around? Um, anatomically, uh, sort of modern human beings, including sort of the brain size and estimated brain capacity, probably between 100 uh, and 200,000 years ago. Okay. So when you talk about an event that happened 56 million years ago, uh, that's approximately 56 million <laughs> years before we appeared. That's right. Now, if you really want to have your mind blown, um, and hopefully you still have some of that stuff to smoke, because uh, this is going to be mind blowing for you. you know, Brontosaurus, that, that song by the police, it was about the collision that killed the dinosaurs. Hey, right. mighty Brontosaurus. Well, here's what's funny about that. The KPG, that, that collision event was 66 million years ago. There was no Brontosaurus. You have to go back 150 million years to find Brontosaurus. Um, it was long gone at that point. So there is less time that elapsed between that collision that killed off the dinosaurs that did exist, the T-Rexes and the Triceratops. There's less time that's elapsed between then and us today than there is time that elapsed from the time Brontosaurus was roaming the planet to the extinction of the dinosaurs. 
those dinosaurs were farther apart from each other than we are from the dinosaurs. Yeah, I, I, I'm just trying to get... So, Ice Ages. Ice yeah. Ages, uh, most recent Ice Age. Yeah, so the most recent Ice Age, 100 times slower. The warming, it's a, that seems like a rapid event when you look at it from a geological perspective, but it was 100 times slower today, than today. And what caused that Ice Age? What caused that Ice Age? So the uh, coming and going of the Ice Ages, and this was one of the other, you know, contrarian talking points, if you will, for many years. They'd say, well, you know, you scientists, you can't even reproduce the coming and going of the Ice Ages over the past several hundred thousands of years um, with your models. So how can we trust a model that can't reproduce that? Well, as I talk about in the book, actually, we can reproduce that. And we now understand you know, in some detail, it was a complicated sort of interrelated set of factors, but it was driven ultimately by changes in Earth's orbit relative to the sun, um, change in how elliptical that orbit is. Sometimes our orbit around the sun is more it's circular. Sometimes it's a little bit more elliptical. And that changes on a time scale of about 100,000 years. We call it the eccentricity of the orbit. And that changes the, how cold the, the winters are and how warm the summers are just enough that over tens of thousands of years, over a hundred thousand years, if you're in the right con configuration, it can build up an ice sheet and you can establish an ice age. So will we get a warning? Will we, will we, uh, start saying like, holy moly, uh, it looks like in, uh, 50,000 years, we're going to have another ice age. Yeah. J judging by the orbit, a ch change in our orbit. It, 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 we would have very slowly be, been descending into the next ice age in the absence of fossil fuel burning. Uh, you could say we headed off an ice age to an extent. Uh, the climate was slowly cooling and we started to add some carbon dioxide early on, thousands of years ago. This is called the early Anthropocene hypothesis, and, 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 and there seems to be some merit to it. Even before industrialization, forest clearing, rice cultivation, other things that we were doing were releasing greenhouse gases, CO2 and methane into the atmosphere. And that was warming the planet a little bit, just enough to head off that very slow, gradual descent that we would have been following into an ice age. So you could say, ah, well, that's great. You know, early fossil fuel, you know, the release of fossil fuels um, the re or rather the release of carbon into the atmosphere from these activities, human beings headed off an ice age. And that's absolutely true. A little bit of a good thing, right? If we, if we had left it at that, we'd be in good shape, but we didn't. We decided to get more and more efficient in how we could take carbon out of the ground and put it into the atmosphere. And we gave rise to this exponential increase in carbon dioxide that is now warming the planet again at a rate where we have no precedent. As far back as we look, no other episode where human beings certainly and other living things have been called upon to adjust to a rate of warming as great as what we are now causing. Now, I, I, read an article in the New York Times, uh, a piece about the Canadian forests are now net emitters of CO2. Yeah. And not a carbon sink, which is what people always thought the huge forests of Canada were. Yeah. But because yeah. of the forest fires and also because of clear cutting and other kinds of things. And and the, the article also said that the Amazon is heading that yeah. direction as well. That was one of the scariest things I've read of late. Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely right. And and this is one of the problems when we say, oh, we can solve this problem by planting, a, you know, a billion trees. You may remember this was uh, Donald Trump's solution to climate. He, he had to come up with something. <laughs> And uh, since he, you know, supports the continued uh, extraction of fossil fuels in the fossil fuel industry, he came up with, well, okay, well, we'll just, you know, suck up that carbon by planting lots of trees. Um, here's the problem. First of all, to do that at the scale that would be necessary is impossible. There's no way, you know, it's like emptying, uh, you know, the water from your boat with a Dixie cup when there's a gaping hole in the bottom and the water is rushing in. Uh, that's sort of what tree planting is. It's sort of deck chairs on the Titanic 
if, if you will. So, and there's another problem with that is, hey, if those forests that you're planting and the carbon you're bearing goes up in smoke because of these massive wildfires, then it doesn't help at all. And we are seeing that. We saw that in Canada this summer. We saw that uh, a few years ago when I was in Australia during what they now call the Black Summer, where they had these you know, this massive drought and, 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 and heat that gave rise to these bushfires that spread out across the continent. And in that year, Australia put more carbon into the atmosphere from its forest fires than it did from all of its fossil fuel burning, its use of oil, natural gas, and coal. Um, so there's a lesson there about the hubris of thinking that we can somehow offset all of this by, say, planting trees. There is a little bit of good news here, which is that that carbon, the carbon that's released from those forest fires, you know, if we stop warming the planet, stop making the summers drier in these regions, you know, and, and we can bring these forests back, then that carbon we can take out of the atmosphere pretty quickly. The carbon that was put into the atmosphere from these trees, you know, had only been held by those trees for, you know, a hundred years, maybe at most an old growth forest, hundreds of years. The problem with fossil fuel carbon is that's been beneath the surface of the planet for tens of millions of years. That's essentially permanent carbon. When we take that stuff out, we burn it and put it into the atmosphere. That's carbon that had been sequestered for many millions of years that we're now putting into the atmosphere. So in many respects, it's a lot worse than uh, the carbon that comes from, you know, or, or get the organic carbon that would come from a forest fire or deforestation or some of these other activities. I want to ask you about methane. Because in the book you write about, it, it seems like the, it's a myth that we're going to have this huge influx of methane yeah. uh, from like places, I guess, like uh, the Arctic or Siberia. Or I had been fearing that, and I was heartened to hear you say that that's not the, the case that people have, have uh, put forward. Is that correct? It is. And this is one of the things that I set out to sort of um, to deal with in the book is sort of the doomism that has arisen in recent years um, that is sometimes premised on a misrepresentation of the paleoclimate record of what happened with our climate in the past for so long. And, you know, and that's where we started out, you know, uh, climate change deniers have been misrepresenting the lessons from Earth's past uh, to argue against climate change, right? This whole talking about, well, climate change is naturally, it's changed before. How do we know this is any different? That's what we used to have to deal with. But increasingly in recent years, there's a problem at the other end of that spectrum, which is the doomers. Th these aren't climate deniers. Um, in many case, cases, these are like environmental progressives who are very concerned about the environment, but they've become convinced that it's too late to do anything. And in part, they've become convinced of that because there have been some very prominent players out there um, and, and magazines, newspaper articles, books that promote this idea that we are already experiencing runaway warming. And the argument goes that we're, we've warmed up the Arctic and the permafrost and it's releasing all this methane that was stored. Yep. That's that's what I've been yeah. fearing and reading and fearing. Yeah, and, and and it creates a runaway effect. You know, the methane release causes more warming. The warming releases more methane, and and so on. And so the argument is, that we we've started this runaway warming scenario that we can't. We're stop. doomed. We're doomed. Oh yeah, maybe we are. Hmm. No, to, no, you're oh. telling me now we're not doomed. Oh, good. Okay, sorry. Just mind um, you. Oh, I, I was mission. worried there. I thought yeah. maybe you. you um, <laughs> no, I mean you know so that's. In, in one of the things that we see, first of all, it's not true. We can actually measure the isotopic content of the methane. And we can tell the methane that's building up in the atmosphere isn't sort of natural methane that's being released from the permafrost. Um, it looks like it's coming from a combination of fossil fuels, natural gas extraction. Natural gas is mostly methane. Um, when, you know, during fracking, some of that methane um, is released into the atmosphere. And, and that is worse 
than CO2, the methane, but it lasts shorter time. Yeah, it's worse in the short term, but it doesn't last as long. Uh, but, it, but it has added to the warming, and it is an important, you know, we, we do need to worry about methane too. But that is being produced basically by human activity. It's not a natural runaway release of methane that's unstoppable and we can't do anything about. The methane that's building up is because of what we're doing, we're extracting you know, natural gas and some of it probably coming from livestock and agricultural practices. So yes, methane is increasing, but it's caused by human activity and we can you know, stop those activities that are generating methane, which is just the opposite of what the doomers would have you believe. It's a natural release um, and it's a runaway process and we can't stop it. And here's why it's so important to sort of reclaim the paleoclimate record and the lessons it offers us. The doomers will often point to some of these past events, like the PETM that I talked about. And they'll say, aha, that was a runaway methane-driven warming, a proof that that's what caused those extinctions and that's what's going to cause our extinction today. And so I, you know, go through very carefully the state of scientific understanding here. And our understanding today is that these methane feedbacks that we're talking about, yes, some methane is released from the permafrost when it warms up, but that was a small effect, maybe 10% of the warming that occurred during that PETM event. The vast majority of the warming was caused by CO2 just like we are generating CO2 today, carbon dioxide through fossil fuel burning. In that case, it was a volcanic release of CO2, but the culprit was CO2. And that was the problem as it is today. The problem wasn't methane, and it certainly wasn't some runaway massive methane release. So I felt like I had to sort of address okay. that particular claim and reclaim you know, what the record really tells us. Well, you we want to deal with the reality, and that's... Thank God we have scientists like you. And, and that's another thing. Uh, climate scientists, are, uh, are you paid by lefties and, uh, and uh, paid to put out this bullshit? Oh, yeah. I get a check every month from, <laughs> from George Soros, who uh, oh, was right. also paying me for the space lasers that I developed. You might have heard about those. Um, uh, I think that was the Rothschilds. Well, they take all the credit, but, you know, um, I, I contributed the substantially. The point, it was Jewish. Well, right. It was it Jewish. Jewish space laser. It was in space lasers, and we were causing the wildfires with the space lasers and then claiming that there's a climate crisis. It's really Pretty good despicable. propaganda move, though. <laughs> then that, that was smart. Cause right. wildfires in California to kill people. Well, we can move those space lasers around. We moved them up to Canada this last summer. Uh huh. Yeah, and they were down in Australia a few years ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, Michael, thank you. Uh, is there any any last words you want to just uh, for, for Bob Danielson here? Yeah, Bob, read the book "Our Fragile Moment" because I think it'll address uh, a lot of the fallacies that you may have been fed. Uh, what I I know you're a good person because you're a friend of Al, and any friend of Al is a friend of mine. Um, so, you know, let's see if we can maybe address some of those uh, fallacies that you probably heard. And, uh, and frankly, I think the, the, the book's a good read. I think you'll enjoy it, too. Thank you, Michael. And uh, Bob, I'll um, alert you to this, and uh, you'll listen to it, and we'll have a, uh, uh, hopefully, when, next time I'm, I'm, I'm back in uh, Minnesota, uh, we'll have a meal over it, and, and you'll say, you know, thank you for thinking of me, but mm. I still think. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I hope you enjoyed uh, listening. That beautiful music is by Leo Kotke, the great Leo Kotke. I want to thank Peter Ogburn for producing this podcast. We'll talk again next week. Mm-hmm.